We know, unfortunately, still less than 1% of all of the works performed by all American orchestras are by any composer of color. Every single audience member, white, black, Native American, Asian American, whatever it might be, are done a disservice. We are all robbed of the artistry that could otherwise impact our lives. That's violinist, social entrepreneur, professor, author, MacArthur Fellow, and member of the National Council on the Arts, Aaron Dworkin. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast from the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Well, as you just heard, Aaron Dworkin is a man of many talents. And he's also a man with conviction, passion, and the ability to turn ideas into reality. A violinist from early childhood, Dworkin realized while an undergraduate at the University of Michigan that he saw very few African-American and Latinx musicians in orchestras, and those same orchestras rarely played music by people of color. Well, most people would have grumbled about this, but Aaron Dworkin got to work. In 1997, he founded the Sphinx Organization whose goal was to address the underrepresentation of people of color in classical music. Beginning as a competition for African-American and Latinx string instrumentalists, Sphinx grew into a force in classical music. It's developed four robust program areas that reach more than 100,000 students and artists annually. Its aim is to develop and support Black and Latinx talent in classical music at every level, from music education to performing artists to repertoire, from arts leadership to administrators to audiences. It still has the Sphinx competition, and the organization also has its own orchestra, known as the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra, composed of Black and Latinx professionals from around the United States and it supports five other ensembles. It's become an important pipeline for people of color in the classical world. In 2015, Aaron stepped back from leadership at Sphinx, but he keeps on fighting the good fight. He became the Dean at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance at the University of Michigan, where he's now a professor of arts leadership and entrepreneurship, as well as a professor of entrepreneurial studies at the business school. He is also the author of several books, including the recent The Entrepreneurial Artist, Lessons from Highly Successful Creatives. And Aaron Dworkin is the host of a weekly public television show, Arts Engines. And believe me, I am just scratching the surface of his remarkable accomplishments. While in the past year, many organizations, including arts organizations, have been attempting to grapple with racial inequity and a lack of diversity, Aaron Dworkin, as we heard, has been deeply involved with these issues for decades. I was lucky enough to speak with him as 2020 was coming to an end. Here's our conversation. Aaron, well, first of all, thank you so much for giving me your time in this week between Christmas and New Year's. But, you know, there is a confluence of events that you seem singularly positioned to speak to. The pandemic and its impact on the performing arts happening with the long overdue racial reckoning that is being felt throughout society, including maybe even particularly in the arts. So maybe we should begin with the Sphinx organization, which you founded in 1997, which really speaks to this. Absolutely. And first of all, it's just wonderful to be able to be uh, here with you and uh, to, of course, have such an important conversation at a unique time. And I completely agree. I would say that in my lifetime, there's never been both a time period of greater strife and division related to racial issues and disparities, but also a time of greater opportunity. Uh, And I really very much believe that. And of the change that I've been at least seeing in terms of change beginning, whether that there will be follow through, we'll have to see. 
So, but, uh, but yeah, over 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to found the Sphinx organization, which was really built out of my own experiences as a African-American biracial violinist and, and my experiences in the field of the arts and looking at the field in its entirety and seeing is, is there something we can do to at least move the needle to make this extraordinary art form more inclusive and representative? Well, you know, we all have great ideas, but birthing them in the real world then is the big part too. And I'd just like you to talk a little bit about some of the steps you took that brought the Sphinx organization into being and that you see as necessary for any endeavor like this, because I think this is also a time where we're all thinking, we're all talking, but we also have to start doing. <laughs> yes, yes. Unfortunately, all too often, I hear a lot of people talk or especially complain. <laughs> and then when I always ask, oh, what are you doing about that? There's usually a lot more silence, unfortunately. So yes, a lot more doing. And, and unfortunately, dreams are, are not enough. And so, you know, when I had this dream that our world in the arts could be more inclusive and could be diverse and representative of, you know, our overall population, that dream is pretty much other than, you know, something to fall asleep to is pretty useless to the rest of society and certainly to any of the issues at hand, right? We have to translate that dream into reality. So several things. One is that I certainly went about building the infrastructure so that implementing the dream could take place. So i.e. actually building an organization and you know incorporating and, and building a board and understanding who were not only gonna be the volunteer board members and people who could help begin to make this a reality, but also people who are either gonna volunteer as staff or initially you know, intern or be paid to be able to begin to do this work. So all of that, plus of course my own work in the issue, and in research and in understanding what happened and all of that, and then really laying out a thoughtful plan of how we could begin to make a difference. And so I think those types of steps are just critically important because without that, you're really not gonna be able to bring about substantive, sustainable change in terms of whatever it is that you're trying to build. One of your first contributions came from the head of the World Bank, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because I think it's that mixture of taking every step you can and just rolling dice that's also really important when you're trying to build something. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that did come out of that. And and that was James Wolfenson, who at the time was president of the World Bank and unfortunately uh, just very recently passed and played an extraordinary role. Uh, to this day, I think that potentially absent of his commitment, it is substantially less likely that Sphinx would even exist as an organization. And so I didn't know him at the time. And so one of those functional things that I was doing that you can actually plan for is talking to whoever you know you can talk to about these issues and about who should I be in touch with and all of those types of things. So in the course of those conversations, someone said to me, well, you know, you should really reach out to James Wolfenson, you know, president of the World Bank. I'm like, Okay, because he happens to be a cellist. So yes, he's got, you know, all this finance role, but he understands and cares about music and social issues and equity and all of these types of things. And so he did. And he ended up responding saying, you know what, here's a one time $10,000 contribution. This seems like a good project. Go to it. And of course, that's at the stage for a year later, me having to go back and say, I know you said one time, <laughs> uh, but uh, because persistence is absolutely key for any good social entrepreneur. But his belief in a yet unproven project was truly extraordinary. And so I think it's both the methodical approach of, OK, who's funding, you know, these other organizations in the arts, who's funding diversity initiatives, let's reach out to them with very targeted outreach, et cetera. But also let's have these conversations and let's just throw the dice with some very potentially unlikely sources because you never know when you might be able to make that connection. As you said, you came to this as a musician initially and you were a violinist, are a violinist. You still play the violin. How did you come to the violin? I actually began when I was five. My mother, my adoptive mother, was an amateur violinist. 
And uh, she had been listening to this recording of Nathan Milstein playing the unaccompanied Bach, which are amazing. There was a connection that she really had, and it kind of reinvigorated her own playing. And I loved it and picked it up. And I had an extraordinary opportunity very early on to have a great teacher, Vladimir Grafman, who really helped plant those initial seeds for me on the violin. And that's when you were living in New York City. And then your parents moved to Hershey, Pennsylvania, which was difficult because race really became front and center for you for the first time. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So, you know, 10 years old, literally moved from, you know, midtown Manhattan, where you see everyone, right? And all kinds of people and all kinds of colors and shapes and sizes and all that to Hershey, Pennsylvania, which at the time, you know, one black family in my school and me, big Afro, last name Dworkin, played the violin. So yeah, it was it led to um, wonderful learning experiences and character building. <laughs> as I like to reflect back on it, but at the time, certainly very tough, very ostracizing. And my music, my instrument was a key solace for me. And you spent two very formative years at Interlock in a school for young artists in Michigan, the beginning of your love affair with Michigan. Tell me why the, those couple of years were so important to you. Well, you know, to this day, I still credit the Interlock and Arts Academy with saving my life. You know, in, in Hershey at the time, I was beginning to get into some trouble, becoming very rebellious, all of those types of things. And, and in large part, because I felt so isolated and disconnected. You know, there were the various cliques in school and all of that. And I was just kind of outcast. And even in my violin, I felt outcast with other musicians because I was the only black person in the orchestra, even though I was concertmaster you know, of the Harrisburg Youth Symphony. And, and the other kids in the orchestra, for example, wouldn't be quiet when I got up to tune the orchestra and things like that. And so I just was really, really having a tough time. And I think if not for Interlock and could have absolutely, not only could have, but most likely would have gone down uh, a much darker road and darker path, I think, because there wouldn't have been a solace or a point of comfort and, and empathy for what I was experiencing. Uh, I certainly wasn't finding that anywhere. And at Interlochen, not only did I develop friendships that continue to this day in terms of my closest friends, our, our friends from Interlochen, but it was the first time I was surrounded by everyone who was in the arts. And so it was no longer, are you part of this clique or that clique, but are you a creative writer, right? Are you a dancer? Are you an actor? Are you, are you a musician, right? And, and so it was more about your art form and your art making that was kind of defining you. And, and I guess it gave me an opportunity to, to redefine myself. Whereas in Hershey, I really couldn't help but have others define me at Interlock. And it was kind of the first opportunity in my life where I could define myself and met extraordinary people with whom I've been able to, you know, be on this wild adventure and journey of life together. According to your memoir, you had seen yourself as having a solo career as a violinist. I mean, when you were younger, when you were a teenager, high school, I mean, you even had dreams of bringing the Cold War to an end through the force of your music. But then you move from the stage to being the founder and director of Sphinx. Was that a difficult transition for you? So, yeah, and probably I am sure that, you know, some probably say, you know, at the very least delusions of grandeur, if not, <laughs> or, you know, growing up and really, I was like, I'm going to be the world's greatest soloist. And yes, not only like bring together because as the first great, you know, black violin soloist, not only would I bring together people of all races in America, but I'd be the first to win the Tchaikovsky competition and bring, you know, Russia and America together with my music. So, yeah, just slight uh, ambitions uh, relating to my violin playing. So needless to say, they didn't bear out. And what actually occurred was that, uh, you know, I started out at Penn State and then actually ended up needing to drop out, which is a whole long story, but dropped out for four years and got a lot of real world experience. But during that time, I also was not practicing very much. And so then when I had the opportunity to go back to school at Michigan, I was now four years older than my peers. And basically I came back as a transfer student. So for my junior year, undergraduate at Michigan. 
And at that time, all those things that used to be so easy for me to do on the violin, and it was really just a, cha- a matter of, I was I practicing enough, but I could do anything I wanted. I felt like I could be, you know, first chair or whatever, as long as I put the work in. But now I was putting the work in and the results were not coming, certainly nearly as fast. And so that was very humbling. And it really kind of got me thinking about what was I going to do? And I realized that if I really was going to either be a soloist, and by that time, those dreams had kind of dialed back to, you know, get into a major orchestra, (laughs) which is, of course, extraordinarily competitive, 10 times more competitive than getting into an Ivy League school. But I was thinking about that and, and thinking I could, I thought, and I thought reasonably so, get into a major orchestra, but the work that it would take at that point, certainly at least six to seven hours a day in the practice room, I realized that I did not love. I had actually never loved practicing. It was always one of my big issues. I loved playing the violin, but not practicing. So I did it begrudgingly and minimally so that I could play the violin well in public and especially in chamber music. And so I looked and I said, I don't want to sit in a practice room and do that work. And so I began to think about, well, what do I want to do? And that led to this exploration at Michigan, whereas I credit Interlock and with saving my life, I credit the University of Michigan with building my life. And around that time, I began thinking about my race and my violin and the cultural experiences I was having and the fact that there were, you know, almost no musicians of color in any of these circumstances or that I didn't know there were any black composers or go to any major orchestra concerts and not see anyone on stage or in the audience who looked like me. And so all of those thoughts started coalescing. And then that, of course, led to this idea of, well, I don't like that. And this is such an extraordinary art form. And what if I could do something about it? What if there was a competition for young Black and Latinx string players and we could come together, play music by composers of color? And if we do that, the whole world of classical music will become diverse. Again, I still had the delusions of of grandeur. This time it wasn't about my own personal ability as a violinist, but now it was the impact that this idea could have. So as that was beginning to build, that question that you raised of, well, what about the volatility, the competition between my own playing and building this organization began to come about. And what I found was that I was spending more than six to seven hours a day on the organization and loving it. Even though it was very, very hard, I loved it and I felt driven to do it. And so I'd be up two or three o'clock in the morning or later very, very often, most days of the week, working on building Sphinx, something I never would have done on the violin. I just never would have been in the practice room two to three o'clock in the morning. And so I started thinking about that. And then one day it completely dawned on me that Sphinx had become my primary instrument. And just like in school, when we say, okay, well, you know, I'm, you know, my major is violin, but I'm minoring in piano or whatever, right? My primary instrument had switched to the organization itself. And then I began looking at it as an actual functional instrument that I needed to dedicate myself to. And when I made that switch, it became very clear. And I really did not regret then really backing away from a lot of my violin work. Of course, the Sphinx organization went far beyond a competition. Sphinx has vast programming in education, artistic development, entrepreneurial skills, arts leadership, among other programs. It hosts major convenings. So, Erin, you thought long and hard about inclusion and diversity. And I would like you to tell us all why it's important for a person to see somebody who looks like them on a stage in an orchestra and then why it's important for all of us to see the great diversity that's America. Absolutely. On a stage. Yeah. So I love Chimamanda Adichie, and she has this a wonderful quote about the danger of a single story. And she says that the danger of a single story is not that it is untrue, but that it is incomplete. And the stories that we weave in the arts, in our nation, are incomplete. They are not sharing the breadth of the diverse mosaic that comprises the tapestry that is the American experience and the American culture. So for example, when we know unfortunately still 
less than 1% of all of the works performed by all American orchestras are by any composer of color. Every single audience member, white, black, Native American, Asian American, whatever it might be, are done a disservice because they now are prevented from experiencing the music, the artistic creations that reflect those cultures, those stories. We are all robbed of the artistry that could otherwise impact our lives. And so one of the things that I would always share with orchestras, I say, if your goal as an orchestra, because there's always this thing people say, well, you know, we have artistic excellence. If we get more diverse, we won't have as much artistic excellence. And I always shared, I said, well, if your definition of being an excellent orchestra is by playing the music from Western Europe very excellently well to a subset of your community that represents less than 3% of your community. And you do that very well and that that is how you define excellence, playing a sliver of music to a sliver of people then yes, great, you're doing great at that. But if your goal of excellence is to perform the breadth of great orchestral classical music at the highest artistic level, you are failing significantly at that because there is this breadth of music that A, exists, and or that B, you could be participating in the creation of, through commissioning, that you are not engaged in. And is that work not part of what is the artistic excellence of what it means to be an American orchestra? So that's just kind of say on the creation part, but then also absolutely, of course, if you take a young person of color and you bring them in to a, you know, an amazing orchestra hall and they sit there and they listen to this extraordinary music and, and they look and they don't see themselves while they will be moved by the music. I certainly was when the first time when I was eight years old and went to Carnegie Hall. But then you look on stage and you go, do I belong? No one there looks like me, so clearly I'm not welcome. So there is both, if you will, the impact relating to specific communities of color, but then there is something that is robbed of all of us as a society when we don't hear the breadth of all of the stories that are able to be told by Americans and others around the world. You have long made clear that you think a big factor as to why African-Americans and Latinx musicians have not been accepted more fully into the top ranks of orchestras is that orchestras haven't made inclusion a priority, both on stage and in the repertoire. So there is a, a complexity to that. So there are parts where I would say it is very clear. For example, compositions, the repertoire. The fact that less than 1% of all the repertoire performed by all American orchestras is any composer of color, absolutely, mus the music director and president of any orchestra could change that next week. I absolutely hold them 100% accountable. The music exists, great music exists. Of course, a whole bunch of amazing new music could be commissioned by all of the extraordinary composers of color that are working today or hoping and wishing they could work today if they were receiving those commissions. And that decision could absolutely be made by orchestras immediately. They could absolutely change their repertoire. I do hold them 100% accountable. Now, when it comes to the representation, say, of let's just say Black musicians on stage as full-time members of the orchestra, there are additional complexities there related to, of course, tenure, related to screened audition process, related to how we determine um, musicians, but also, so those are things that could be affected by orchestral administrations, players committees, audition committees, et cetera. But there also, absolutely, there is a smaller pool of musicians because when we look at young people and their ability and access to high quality instructions, to high quality instruments at an early age, we see those disparities. So there it brings in a lot of other factors that we have to look at. And that is part of, of course, what drove the breadth of Sphinx's programs, that we can't just come together with orchestras and say, let's partner and really begin to rethink and to evolve our field. 
But we have to look at elementary schools and say, as we look at young kids who are having the opportunity to be able to pick up a violin, what percentage are Black and Latinx? And why is that? And what can we do about that? Because, of course, if you don't start at an early age, your ability to advance to a high level by graduation and get into a major music school will be less. So then summer programs, what are summer programs doing, right? So we have all of these levels. And this is why Sphinx now has programming at the elementary school level in cities like Detroit and Flint. It has summer programs addressing middle school and high school students uh, and helping to prepare them and, and develop them so they can be competitive for the top uh, music schools in the country. And then, of course, scholarship programs and other support programs like the competition for those who are in college and then programs to help from the transition from college into the professional world. So the reality is, is that there is complexity to systemic change. And what I would posit to orchestras is there are certain components they could absolutely do, and it's simply they are not either willing, able, or courageous enough to make those changes like repertoire that are relatively easy. But then as it relates to the membership of orchestras and or their staffing, which is a little bit easier, that I would say that certainly, obviously, from my perspective, most orchestras could do more. And that's my role as a catalyst <laughs> to say that. Um, and I would say it would be probably pretty impossible for them to ever be doing as much as I think they should be doing. So my role is to encourage, cajole, pressure, and to make the case so that they can understand why financially, ethically, morally, these types of commitments of resources and of initiatives are imperative. Well, adding to that complexity is the fact that for the past couple of decades, arts education in public schools has been gutted, is being gutted. And because of the economic disparity that's aligned with race, the impact on students of color is profound. Completely. <laughs> uh, and so it's a it's a huge issue. And and why not only should, of course, Sphinx and other similar organizations be doing this work that is, let's face it, supplemental in our public schools, but we have to do what we can to encourage and to make the case to those who are determining public policy and especially education policy the importance of the arts and that the arts are integral, that we should be moving from STEM to STEAM. And what are the arts requirements in our schools? And obviously the you know, National Endowment for the Arts and other agencies are, you know, are, are working on this. There is a STEM to STEAM caucus in Congress. There is additional work that, that needs to be done, but we do need to look at public policy because that is also, of course, as it relates to education, the only real way we're going to bring about the type of systemic change that is necessary. You know, one of the things I uh, mention a lot is I talk about Motown, right? Because we're, you know, we've got Detroit here and, you know, such an extraordinary musical history. I often make the case that I think that the equivalent of Motown would be very, very difficult to replicate today because Motown was able to, Barry Gordy was able to benefit from the extraordinary music education that was taking place in schools and the swath of young musicians and those who had extraordinary artistic talents that were able to be furthered and developed in school and be able to build upon that with Motown. You call yourself a social entrepreneur. And in fact, you're a professor of arts leadership and entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan. And you wrote a book recently called The Entrepreneurial Artist, Lessons from Highly Successful Creatives. Tell me about that book, who you spoke to, and why. Yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to do was to really be able to capture the real world, right? When we're in a classroom and, you know, it, it would be very easy for me to delve into the techniques of entrepreneurship for my students or to say, okay, and here's our case studies, here's best practice, so on and so forth. But what I wanted to do is connect them as best as possible, really through case studies, but of real world entrepreneurs, mostly current active, but then also historically. So what I wanted to do was to go and interview these entrepreneurial artists, engage with them, really reflect their stories, some of their adventures in a narrative in the book, 
but through that really pull what were the best practices that they brought to bear? What did they do that either enabled them to be successful and or how did they overcome some of the challenges or failures that existed in their lives? And so each chapter is built around a specific entrepreneurial artist and their experiences, as well as the best practices that are then laid out at the end of that chapter. So I took two historical artists in that, you know, I wanted to take Mozart and, and Shakespeare. And so I, for them, I interviewed kind of leading scholars on them to capture those experiences, but then also wanted a breadth of disciplines. So for example, Bill T. Jones for dance, Lin-Manuel Miranda for musical theater, Jeff Daniels for theater, Marin Alsop for conducting, right? So a really a nice breadth across disciplines so that a reader could really delve into these experiences, both for their own specific artistic discipline or interest, but also in a broader sense too, because I think, you know, a violinist could absolutely learn from Bill T. Jones's experiences in dance. And you have a weekly public television show, Arts Engines, which in a way is an extension of the book. It's conversations with arts administrators. How does that show speak to this moment? Yeah. So there we kind of wanted to take a little bit of a different approach. So whereas my book is really capturing, right, the entrepreneurialism, those who are building sustainable enterprises around their art making. And then we're like, but, you know, our field is sustained by the engines, right, the administrators who keep all of these organizations going and hopefully consistently evolving. And they're doing extraordinary work day in and day out. Um, but oftentimes that work is either lost in that others aren't aware of it unless, you know, once a year we come together for a particular conference and you learn about what a few colleagues are doing. But we were like, what if we could help develop a platform where we could all be learning from each other, these arts administrators on a consistent basis throughout the year. And so that's what that focus is. So I interview a, a leading arts administrator and not just on who they are and, and why they do what they do, but also, are there any particular initiatives they're currently working on so that our audience can look and see and learn and maybe want to replicate or emulate, learn from what some of the work of their peers are doing around the country? And I'm curious, I mean, as you've spoken to so many arts administrators, you really must have a sense about the impact of the pandemic on the performing arts, on orchestras, for example. What are you, what are you hearing Oh, well, it's, of course, just been devastating. And uh, and obviously the recent support in the stimulus package includes the Save Our Stages, which will help to some extent. But obviously it's been the most devastating thing, I think, to happen, obviously across our whole nation, but especially certainly in the arts field. And artists have been affected to a greater extent. A lot of times we look and we think of the frontline work, we think of service workers were thinking of restaurants and so on and so forth, so many of which have had to close and face all of these issues. But musicians and the arts have been affected statistically to a greater extent, even than the restaurant industry. And so that's why it's so important and why it's so great that relief for our field is part of this relief package and stimulus package. So definitely been devastated. But I think in any of these times, right, there are huge areas of opportunity. And so I think that those orchestras, those arts institutions that just look to say, let's just get back, let's get back to normal, right? You know, and a lot of people talk about the new normal, but it is the orchestras, it is the arts organizations who are now thinking about how they're going to redefine what they do, how they're going to take these experiences and changed behavior, some of which will not completely revert of what we do as society and build upon it so that when they come back, they will be better institutions than they were before the pandemic. Because it's those institutions that are going to define the new normal and are most likely going to be the most successful in the new normal. Aaron, you're a member of the National Council on the Arts, which I think of as the Arts Endowment's Board of Directors. <laughs> and I wonder how you see the Arts Endowment and the part it plays to both increase diversity in and accessibility to the arts. And what else you would like to see the Arts Endowment do? So absolutely, and I've been deeply honored to be able to serve um, with some extraordinary colleagues on the council. And obviously, you know, I think first and foremost, 
you know, we're the nation's largest arts funder. So I think first and foremost, and if you ask, I think any arts organizations, they're going to say, money, the NEA, we want grants so that we can do the work that we do. We need this help and we need the support. And so as an individual, I am a huge advocate and proponent of a significant, I wouldn't say increase, I would say transformation in the appropriations and funding for our governments, our nation's support of the arts. And obviously in this shape uh, and form, that is the, the NEA. And, and I think that that should be a transformative. So the resources that we would be able to have at our disposal, I think really do need to be increased. When we look at them percentage wise, obviously they're extraordinarily tiny. So I think that the funding role, critically important, but also, of course, like many government agencies, I think that us being able to have a significant impact, we actually have, you know, the agency is built on various disciplines in the arts field, but one of our main focus areas is accessibility. And so looking at that and making sure that the arts are accessible is also critically important. And DE&I is very, very, very important to the agency, to all of the grant making that's done. And d and is diversity and inclusion. Yes. And so I think that should not only continue, but continue to be redefined and evolved, especially given a lot of the things that have been learned over the past year. And I think momentum in our field, in the arts, I've been seeing things and organizations and leaders talking and acting in ways that I have not seen in the entire history pre-existing that. And so I think we need to build on that momentum and support those who are really looking to evolve their organizations. Well, Aaron, I think that is a great place to leave it. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. It's been wonderful to be able to be here with you. Thank you. That was violinist, social entrepreneur, professor, author, founder of the Sphinx Organization, MacArthur Fellow and member of the National Council on the Arts, Aaron Dworkin. You can find his public television show, Arts Engines, at dptv.org. And for more information about the Sphinx Organization, go to sphinxmusic.org. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. Subscribe to Artworks and then leave us a rating on Apple because it will make us happy because it helps people to find us. Keep up with the Arts Endowment by following us on Twitter at NEA Arts or by checking out our website at arts.gov. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Stay safe and thanks for listening. <laughs>